You're very welcome to St. Patrick's today. It's, it's great to have you with us as we worship the true and the living God via the means made possible to us. On that topic, we are still looking to add to our AV team and we'd love to have you join that team. Alan's been doing a great job over the last while, but really uh, we, it would be great to get him uh, a team and support around him as, as we take this ministry further, uh, reaching out and leading people in worship, even if they cannot be with us physically. Also, I've been asked about giving, um, and if you still wish to, to give to our parish, um, we can receive checks. Uh, we can also, uh, probably the easiest way of doing it actually is by standing order. Um, and if that's something that you'd consider, um, please contact myself or Desi and, and we'll get you the bank details uh, so that you can support the ministry and mission of this parish through that means. Just a, a few announcements. Next week's going to be a little bit different. Um, as we begin our countdown towards Good Friday and Easter Sunday, as we enter in this Holy Week, uh, we're going to be continuing our themes of death defeated and creation restored, flipping to our second um, aspect of that. The last year has just shown us how this world is not the way it's meant to be. It's shown us um, how this world just is defective, how death has still seeped in. But this week we're going to look how God has restored creation and will restore creation. So join us in our series of talks, um, Creation Restored, and that'll be happening on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then on Easter Saturday as well. So please do uh, join us for that. It's gonna be slightly different this week um, because we're going to do that on Zoom. Um, it's the same Zoom ID we've used for almost all of our um, events, um, but you can get that on our website and on our Facebook page. Um, so please log in to our Holy Week services as we look at that theme, Creation Restored, um, via the means of Zoom. That allows us to continue to meet together and encouraging one another. On that um, topic of meeting together, uh, we are hoping to regather, to open our buildings again um, all next Sunday for Easter Sunday as we, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That service will be a service of Holy Communion and will be done in, in as safe a way as possible, following a similar pattern as we did on Christmas Eve, using those little those cups um, that are sanitary. So please do uh, join us for that. There'll be an overflow section as well. Um, uh, so please come along as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That service will also be live streamed for those who, who may not feel safe coming out at the minute. Um, but please do join us either in person, we'd love to see you, or online. So please do stay with us. I want to hand you over to Julie, who's going to lead our service today um, after a brief moment of silence. We begin our service this morning and um, the choir will lead us in Morning Has Broken and I would ask you to join along at home.
confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace that we may be cleansed from all sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. And our minds proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the Lord's name be praised. A reading from the book of the prophet Zechariah. Beginning chapter 9, beginning at the ninth verse. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join together in our psalm this morning, reading by alternate half. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim. His mercy endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness. That I may enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me. Stone which the builders rejected has become, has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and, and it is marvellous in your eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Come, O Lord, and save us, we pray. Come, Come Lord, send us out of the Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has given us light. Make, Make the pilgrims with four strike in the horns of the, of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You, you are my God, and I will exalt you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Glory be to the Father, 
and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be forever. reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 11, beginning at the first verse. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found the colt that outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing? And tying that colt. They answered as Jesus told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their coats over it and he sat on it, many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in, in the fields. Those who went ahead of them followed and shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethlehem with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. And let your children shout for joy. O Lord, save your people. And bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And let your glory be over all the earth. O God, 
Maintain our hearts within us. And renew us by your Holy Spirit. Your collects for today. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility, and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go before us, Lord, in all our days with your most gracious favour, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally by your mercy, attain everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us, that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The choir will now lead us in another hymn, Love of God.
you would speak to our hearts today and that with passion, with love and with grace, we may share that word and love in every way possible. In Jesus' name, Amen. Over the last year, we have increasingly gotten used to not being in crowds. Social distance is our norm. And if a stranger stands too close to us in a shop or whilst we're out for a walk, we become jumpy and we feel that we need to distance ourselves. So in this pandemic world, these images in our text this morning might just seem a little strange. To read just a few verses back in Mark chapter 10, verse 46, that a great multitude was following Jesus may make us feel nervous and uneasy. We are led to believe that Jesus had an entourage. I have only ever been charged with having an entourage once and that was when I was taking my nephew to school on his first day in primary and, and the headmaster joked that Graham had an entourage with him. So his mum, dad, me and another family friend had all accompanied him to the school gates and we waited nervously for the next three hours to hear how he had gotten on. In that sense, it was a significant moment in our family. And we read this morning the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, leading to his crucifixion, and it is both significant and it is familiar. Many of us can all recall acting out the triumphant scene in Sunday school every Palm Sunday. It's a story that is important. It gets told in all four Gospels. And if a story gets told four times, then we probably should sit up and pay attention to it. It's so special that it has a day dedicated to it on our church calendar. It's a story that is situated at a, an important time in our church year as well, as it marks the beginning of Holy Week. Jesus enters Jerusalem as we, as a Christian community, enter Holy Week. It's a week of prayer, of faithfulness, of betrayal and crucifixion. It's a week that just like life isn't easy. It's messy, it's sad and it's complicated. Palm Sunday is a day of joy and anticipation but it is also a day of conflicted feelings. There is dread, resistance and fear bubbling just under the surface too. Mark's Gospel signals to us that the journey we make to the cross this week is important. One third of Mark's Gospel is set during the last days of Jesus' life. And so this account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem is a major turning point in the Gospel of Mark. We are to sit up and we are to take notice. Before we look at the story, we need to set the scene. Jesus is at the end of a journey that has begun nine months before when he had zigzag through Galilee, then Samaria, then Perea, and finally to Judea. This long trek has brought Jesus to the point of destiny and its culmination of the whole of his ministry. He has ministered to 35 localities and has timed his journey so that he would end up in Jerusalem for Passover. And around 200 to 300,000 people would flood into the city for this festival. It was a week that Jews came to Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire to celebrate and to remember the great exodus from Egypt. And we see at the beginning of our passage today, he is back in Bethany, the outskirts of Jerusalem. Expectations are running high. He has raised Lazarus from the dead and most recently we read in just the chapter before that he has restored the site of Bartimaeus. The pilgrims who are with him have witnessed all of these miracles and his entourage has greatly increased. People are now journeying out from Jerusalem to meet with him and see him. But from the beginning of this account in Mark, it can be clearly seen that Jesus is in control of the entire situation. Jesus is both a focal point and the instigator. And the first six verses are devoted to the preparation for entry into Jerusalem. Jesus has both foreknowledge and sovereignty over the course of offence. 
And so we see at the beginning of our text this morning, Jesus sending two of his disciples to obtain an unridden coat. We begin to understand that not only has Jesus planned his time of arrival into Jerusalem, but he has planned his mode of transport too. We know Jesus usually travelled on foot, but he is now going to enter the city on a donkey. This conveys his kingly status. The donkey was carefully chosen, and Jesus' choice of a donkey told the whole world who he was, and it has a whole range of Old Testament connotations. 500 years before, the prophet Zechariah had prophesied that the Messiah would come riding on a donkey. And we heard that in our Old Testament reading this morning. Zechariah said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king come righteous and having salvation. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. And so we see Jesus is fulfilling and succeeding the prophecy as he chose a donkey that nobody had ever ridden before. Biblical culture and culture of this time, an animal devoted to a sacred task must not be one that had been put to ordinary use. This code that was tied in Beth Page points to the oracle announced also by Jacob upon Judah way back in Genesis 49, when he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him shall the obedience of the peoples binding his foal to the fine and his donkey's coat to the choice of fine he has washed his garments in wine and his vestiture in the blood of grapes and so by riding on a donkey jesus not only fulfilled zachariah and jacob's prophecies but he identified himself with the royal line of david the donkey was the royal animal during king david's reign so by riding on a donkey, Jesus not only perfectly portrayed his position of Messiah, he let the whole world know who he was, just as Zachariah said, he was humble and he was gentle. And so we now reach verse 7. We are told about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Mark doesn't really want to overly identify Jesus' entry with um, the Messianic prophecy that we read about in Matthew and John. He refers to be a bit more subtle than that. He details the spreading of cloaks and branches before Jesus, and this suggests the ceremonious welcome of a king, and it's reminiscent of the inauguration of King Jehu in 2 Kings. And in that book we read, they hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him on bare steps. They blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. The song of the pilgrim crowd sang, and shouted on the way to Jerusalem, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna was a customary religious greeting at Passover time. And on the lips of this crowd, it literally means save or save us. And so the people were repeating over and over that Jesus was their deliverer and a cry to God for him to save his people, now the Messiah had come. All four Gospels record that they shouted, Blessed is the one that comes in the name of the Lord. And this is a reference to Psalm 18, which was our psalm this morning, and is both unremarkable and extremely important. It is unremarkable as it is part of the Hallel Psalms that are traditionally sung at major festivals. But what is particular is that it is a psalm that is connected to the kingship of David and that they sang this to a particular person, to Jesus. The active perception that a David-like figure would come and save God's people. And so this morning, all of these factors are significant. They show Jesus was in control and he was making a statement. The words of the crowd were his statement and the donkey he rode on told of his position and his persona. The reference to the psalm echoed his messianic character and the hosannas described the work that he came to do. This was Jesus' moment to receive the messianic kingdom. But ironically, nothing happens. Verse 11 tells us that Jesus went to the temple 
And what, and what he did was he looked around and he simply left. He does nothing. He says nothing. He just leaves and goes back to Bethany. It's such a strange anticalyptic ending to such a triumphant entry that there must be something noteworthy in it. Mark is the only gospel that records it in this way. Matthew tells us the whole city is in turmoil and Jesus goes to the temple and drives out those who are buying and selling. He overturns tables and chairs. Luke tells us that Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and again drives out those who are buying and selling. John doesn't mention the temple. But Mark tells us that Jesus left because it was late and he returned with the disciples to Bethany. In college, we have an expression when we're studying Bible passages, and it is, if you chase rabbits, you might turn up an elephant. And that might seem rather strange, but for me, I am struck by two distinct and random things in this passage this morning. The first is Mark is the only gospel that says he will return the colt to his owner, and the second is that the scene ends so abruptly. And I'm left wondering, why is it that Jesus left the temple I'm wondering if it is that reason why Jesus left the temple to fulfil his promise. And maybe this is definitely an elephant, but as I was wondering the significance of these two things, I began to ponder, does a donkey have more to say to us this morning than just pointing to the position and person of Jesus? Is it designed to make us reflect on our lives? Is the returning of the cult a metaphor for us to contemplate as we move into Holy Week? and maybe beyond? Is Mark offering us an opportunity to take a good look around at everything? An opportunity to look at our lives? The question maybe we need to ask ourselves, what do we need to return to this week? Is there something that you need to release or let go of? We all have things that we carry around with us, things that are no longer good for us, Things that no longer take us anywhere or give us life. Baggage that continues to weigh us down and has a huge effect on our lives. It could be a grudge, resentment, anger, fear, disappointment or regret. It could be that you need to be in control. You always have to be right or you look to others for approval. Or maybe you are a perfectionist. We all have stuff in our lives that we want to shake off. There are moments in each of our lives, hinge moments, life-changing moments, when we need to take a step back and survey the scenery of our lives. And isn't that what Jesus did at the end of our passage this morning? The temple is at the very heart of Jewish life and Jesus was looking at the heart of people. Isn't that maybe what our Lenten journey should be about? to look at our hearts. So maybe this holy week is a week to slow down, to regroup, to take this opportunity and to think about the guilt and sin we carry, to think about the things that chain us to the past, things that we regret, things that we're scared of, and things that maybe overwhelm us. It's not so much maybe at looking around at all the stuff that is on the outside, but looking around at what is within us. So maybe as we journey through Holy Week, it's a time to release it all to God, in trust that he can do something with the stuff that we aren't able to do. For us all, this Holy Week should be about returning, releasing and letting go. It is an opportunity to reclaim those parts of ourselves that are lost, forgotten, ignored or denied. What do we need to return to? Is it joy, beauty, hope, truth and honesty? Coming back to ourselves, we'd be like a new life. The pandemic has given us a time and space to look at all we have, to look at what is missing, what we need and what we feel and to assess who we truly are and who we want to be. We all value all the little things so much more this Easter. Human touch, the ability to catch up with friends and family, 
been able to come to church and receive communion, or maybe just to go for a walk by the sea. Therefore, as we enter Holy Week, I urge you to take the image of this returning coat or donkey with you wherever you go. Bring it to whatever you do. Hold it with you as we read and pray the Holy Week scriptures and liturgies. Make its presence known as you engage with people at home, in work, on Zoom, or even when we're shopping. Jesus studied everything in that temple on Palm Sunday, and so this week we must leave nothing behind. We bring into this, all that we bring into this week can be restored, it can be renewed, it can be recreated, and it can be resurrected. Returning the cult is how this Holy Week begins for us. And as we journey together through Holy Week, returning to God and ourselves is how hopefully this week will end. The triumphant entry is not just about a donkey ride, the Psalms, the Hosannas, the crowds, although they're all significant and important as they point to the character, the person and the purpose of Jesus. But for us, the triumph and challenge is looking around and leaving nothing behind. Palm Sunday is the start of a journey to the cross, no matter how uncomfortable, so that we see how God transforms the cross from an instrument of death to a symbol of new and eternal life. And my hope and prayer for us all this week is that we will all join on the journey of Holy Week, that we will all look around and leave nothing behind. Let us pray. Loving God, as we step into Holy Week, we remember the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We sing your praises and acknowledge that you are the true King, a leader greater than all the others. We thank you that in your great mercy you became like us, taking on human form and living among us. And as we celebrate and shout Hosanna today, may we keep in mind all that is ahead of us this week. We pray that you will keep us faithful in word and deed, and that we will search our hearts and be open to change and renewal. But we ask that during this time of reflection, that you help us to hold fast, and that you will mould and shape us into the people that you want us to be. Amen. We now take a moment of reflection as we listen to the, the duet brought to us from Halley and Abbey, Praise the Father.
should Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. The response to the words, Hosanna to the Son of David, is glory in the highest. Loving God, we worship you with glad and joyful praise. We welcome Christ once more as our King, our Lord and our Saviour. We promise to him our loyalty and obedience to bring him our love and we bow to him in worship we greet him with wonder hosanna to the son of david glory in the highest heaven loving god speak to us as we read and hear your word help us to see that it is not only in the welcome of Palm Sunday, but in the rejection that followed that Jesus revealed your glory. And so help us to offer him our service and our worship, our commitment and our discipleship in all our days, through good times and the bad. Hosanna to the Son of David, glory in the highest heaven. Gracious God, as we remember this day, how Jesus entered Jerusalem to cries of celebration, help us to welcome him afresh into our lives. Accept the praise and the worship we bring you and give us a real sense of expectation as we look towards the coming of his kingdom. Hosanna to the Son of David. Glory in the highest heaven. Gracious God, like your people long ago, we do not always see clearly. Our faith can be shallow and self-centered. We do not understand as we should. Our praise can be short-lived and superficial. But we ask you to take the faith that we offer, weak though it may be, and deepen it through this day so that we can truly welcome Christ our King and worship him with joyful praise in every aspect of our lives. Hosanna to the Son of David, glory in the highest heaven. Loving God, Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem in quiet humility taking the form of a servant, even to the point of death on a cross, emptying himself so that we might be filled. We ask you to bring your love, your hope, and your power into our troubled world. With all its needs and its tensions, its problems and its evils. We ask you to pour out your power in the context of the current COVID pandemic. We ask you that you would pour out your wisdom on le our leaders as they address the struggles and decisions that lay before them. We ask that you would fill them with your love as we reach out and support one another in this strange and difficult time. We pray for those 
for whom this pandemic has brought a tremendous strain on their mental health. Remind them that you are with them and that your church stands with them. And may they know your love. We pray for those who are ill at this time, both in our community and beyond it. And we pray particularly for Frida, for Jim, for Rosie, for Andrew, for Doris, for John, for Jean, for Katie, for Sonia, for Anne, for Denise, for Debbie, for David, for Helen, for Kate, for Derek, for Stephanie, and for Tom. May they know your healing presence, your support, and your love. We remember also the Greg family at this time, as they mourn the loss of Robin. Bring them the comfort and the hope that comes from the resurrection of your son. Lord, we ask that you would keep your hand upon each and every one of them, all those who struggle at this time, in body or in mind, so that they may know your peace, your love, your hope and your comfort. Lord, reach out with your church to the world. Despite our weakness of faith and the rejection of so many, may your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Hosanna to the Son of David. Glory in the highest heaven. And together we bring our time of prayer to an end. As we say together, Merciful Father, accept these our prayers. For the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The choir will now lead us in our final hymn. Praise to the Lord. to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us, um, being with us at this time. Um, we look forward to welcoming you to our building uh, next Sunday for our Easter Sunday celebrations. Thank you.